Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the regularly scheduled meeting of the Board of Public Works for today, Monday, September 16th, 2019. Commissioner Garcia, Cabello, James Davis, and Caloza are present. President James, you do have a quorum. May we start with Bureau introductions, please, starting with Bureau of Engineering. Good morning. My name is Bert Mokelbust. I'm with the Bureau of Engineering. Good morning, Robert Potter, Bureau of Sanitation. Good morning, Victor Tercios, Bureau of Street Lighting. Good morning, Lance Awishi with the Bureau of Street Services. Good morning, Brett McReynolds, Bureau of Contract Administration. Good morning, Ted Jordan, Public Works General Counsel. Fernando Campos, Executive Officer. President James, we did receive one speaker card under general public comment. I'm sorry, two speaker cards under general public comment. We have no commentary under the Neighborhood Council comment section. We also receive a speaker card on item number one and also on item number two. Um, okay, um, let's go ahead and take item number two, authorization to open bids. Um, recommending that the board authorize the executive officer, Dr. Fernando Campos, or the assistant executive officer, TJ Knight, to receive, open, and declare bids to be received at 10 a.m. on Wednesday, September 18, 2019, and to formally report on the results of the bid opening at the Friday Board of Public Works meeting, scheduled for 10 a.m. Friday, September 20, 2019. Uh, that's because this Board of Public Works will be in an off-site evening meeting in the community um, on Wednesday morning. Mr. Sachs on number two. Yes, thank you. Good morning. Um, I'm somewhat concerned about opening up bids. Opening up bids, it doesn't mention what the projects are. It doesn't mention, um, so how can you open bids if you don't know what the projects are? I mean, I understand last week that uh, somebody lost their mind by allowing companies to get exclusive contracts through the city for from five years to ten years and from two years to five years, but... Uh, just look at the motion, Mr. Sachs. It tells you what the projects are. Oh, Go ahead. oh I'm sorry. I didn't see the, well, the motion is not part of the, Go ahead. the, the um, agenda. So Both if you don't, orally, if, but go ahead. if you don't see the motion, then you don't know. And if you uh, are a small business and you want to get involved in this, you don't see the motion. You don't told to go to the motion. Um, you need to have inside information on that. And it doesn't make sense that, um, so much secrecy is involved in bids that would be open to the public. Um, that's a real part of the problem with local government is everything is kept secret and you just don't know exactly where the money is going, where the money is coming from. So thank you. I appreciate you considering uh, putting that over for better, more discussion. Uh, thank you, Mr. Sachs. Dr. Campos on number two. Good morning, Commissioners. Fernando Campos, Executive Officer. The motion before you is to authorize myself or my assistant executive officer to open up two bids. Uh, to address Mr. Sachs' question, the two bids that will be opened on Wednesday at 10 a.m. here in the boardroom is the Sherman Way Streetscape Improvement Wilbur Avenue to Lind Lindley Avenue project in Council District 3 at an estimated price of $2,215,374 even. The second bid that will be open is for the Vermont Stormwater Capture and Green Street Phase 2 project in Council District 8 at an estimated price of, or an estimated cost of $1,638,000. Again, as you mentioned earlier, as you introduced the uh, item, this motion is just to authorize us to, uh, authorize myself and or my assistant executive officer to uh, open up the bids in the absence of not having a regular scheduled board meeting in the morning at 10 a.m. The evening meeting at 5.30 is at the California Science Center um, that will be held at 5.30 p.m. in Council District 9. Right, and the reason um, also that, we're, that, we do, uh, that we do have Dr. Campos or the assistant executive officer come in on a Wednesday morning here and open the bids is because it, uh, we always do our bid openings on Wednesday morning. That, and we don't want to disrupt the apple cart by moving it to a Monday or Friday just for the purposes of Mr. Sachs of keeping the continuity um, and the routine in practice because that's what businesses are, uh, know of the Board of Public Works. That's when they expect to hear bid openings. That's why we continue to do it on Wednesday uh, to not change the schedule. In addition to that, these uh, both these uh, projects were advertised through the regular board agenda and both these projects were authorized to be advertised by this board so those items are scheduled in previously um, board meetings right go ahead uh, thank you uh, so that's the motion I'll second it uh, well it's my motion Commissioner Cabello seconds it uh, um, 
Any objection? Without objection, we'll adopt agenda item number two. Any issues sending number two forthwith? We'll send number two forthwith. Let's go ahead and take general public comment. Uh, Mr. Sachs on general public comment. Yes, thank you. Good morning again, Arnold Sachs. Um, so I have a copy here of Thursday, September 12th, uh, Wall Street Journal. There were some stories here that were very interesting. Uber vows to fight California legislation on gig economy. Um, Governor Newsom is going to sign a new bill. I would suggest he not sign it. There's a part in this new bill that said something to the effect that uh, the worker is independent and free to perform the services provided without company control, that these services are outside the employer's usual course of business, and that the contractor works independently in the same type of business as the contracted work. Well, if the contractor works in the same type of business as the contracted work, then he's the driver. And usually Uber and Lyft drivers are not, they're part-time workers for another, they have, it's what gig economy is, you do part-time work. This is just a sham to uh, stop them from becoming independent contractors and getting the benefits that they're due to be paid. The hourly wage, the pen, whatever, if there's a pension, and, uh, and more importantly, health insurance. It's really weird how the state of California works on some of these things. Um, there's another story here. We work is struggling to win over doubters. It's, this company is worth $47 billion. Estimate. $47 billion. That's more than the County Board of Supervisors budget. That's more than the City of LA's budget. And that's more than MTA's budget put together. And they haven't done anything. And the most important one, Oracle Company CEO to go on medical leave. The CEO is going on medical leave. That's, that's pretty amazing for the Oracle Company to go on medical leave like that. You leave a business wide open. And it must be the stress of doing business. Um, and one other thing real quick. If you're a fan of Trinidad, you might have read the newspaper story. Three minutes. That's a heads up. Good morning, Jamie Hall with Channel Law Group, speaking on behalf of Sunshine Hill Residents Association uh, and myself. First, um, I'm here today to publicly apologize for my inarticulate statement at the last public hearing at 1147 Laurel Crest Drive. I was speaking extemporaneously and I completely misspoke. I've appeared before this board uh, many times in the past and I know that this commission and the commissioners carefully listen to all sides um, uh, on an issue. So I wanted to formally apologize and I submitted uh, a letter for the record on that. Uh, second, I'm here to ask that the board reconsider um, the item for 11472 Laurel Crest Drive in order to add a condition that the permits not be issued until September 24th, 2019. That's the effective date of the city's new CEQA appeal ordinance. Um, my client intends on filing a CEQA appeal um, and the appeal ordinance um, provides for an automatic stay um, so that the trees aren't removed during the appeal process. So we're in, in this weird situation where we want to file an appeal, we want to use the city's new CEQA appeal ordinance, but it doesn't become effective till September 24th. So during that little window from today to the 24th, we would ask that you add a condition to the permit to ensure that the permits aren't issued. Uh, and that's to preserve the status quo, and we think that it is um, in line with the City Council's intent in adopting the CEQA appeal ordinance, which is to ensure that there is no removal of trees during the appeal process. So um, uh, we thank you very much for your consideration, and um, I'm available for any questions if you have any. Thank you.
Uh, let's go to agenda item number one. Um, let me call agenda item number one. Policy number 797, establishment of revocable permit. It's an R permit policy for sidewalk encroachments. Recommending that the board approve the R permit policy for sidewalk encroachments. That's transmittal number one. Um, let's start with Mr. Allen. I've got Ramsey Sawaya and um, Ted Allen and Adele Hajkaleo from Street Services. Um, I've got some speaker cards on number one as well. Uh, Mr. Allen, why don't um, you um, kind of guide uh, the, uh, the report from engineering's perspective and then we'll hear from Mr. Haj Khalil from Street Services. It is a joint report. Good morning. Thank you, President James. Good morning, Commissioners. Uh, Ted Allen, Deputy City Engineer with the Bureau of Engineering. Uh, on February 22nd of this year, the Board of Public Works approved a motion directing the Bureau of Engineering and Bureau of Street Services to review and, dr and draft updated permitting criteria and guidelines for right-of-way encroachments. In consultation with representatives from the Mayor's Office, City Council, Los Angeles Police Department, um, and the City Attorney's Office, and we did also consult with the Department on Disability. Um, so I'm happy to report back today with um, the final uh, results from those consultations and meetings. A lot of effort has been put into this and a lot of uh, careful consideration of the criteria that we would bring forth to you uh, for consideration and approval today. Uh, included as transmittal one is the proposed uh, policy guidelines that we're uh, presenting for consideration of approval. Um, and I'll walk through that briefly and then of course I'll be happy to answer questions uh, afterwards. Um, so this policy um, starts by listing some of the things that would typically apply to and these are encroachments in the sidewalk area such as railings, fences, bollards, signs and monuments planters, private structures, stairways, and ramps. It does not apply to things that already have other policies or are not within that subject area, such as below ground encroachments, non-standard surface improvements, sidewalk dining, adopt a median projects, above ground facilities, horizontal projections from buildings over eight feet above the surface, and street furniture that's uh, under separate contract with the Bureau of Street Services or LADOT. Uh, so walking through it briefly, it, it breaks the sidewalk area into three zones. Um, there's a frontage zone near the front of the buildings. There's an amenity zone where a lot of street furniture exists near the street. And then there's the pedestrian access route, which is the main pedestrian path, which is typically between those two areas. So it clarifies that these encroachments would not be allowed to reduce the pedestrian access route to less than five feet. So it will uh, ensure that we continue to meet uh, ADA requirements. Uh, it specifies that we would not allow people to block loading zones, of course. Uh, it limits the height of encroachments to 42 inches for railings and whatnot. Um, it requires that the, sidewalk, the pedestrian access route, the sidewalk area in the area of these proposed encroachments would be made to be ADA compliant. So if the sidewalk's not ADA compliant, we would require the permittee to make it ADA compliant with the exception that if cross slope, uh, which is the slope from the building area to the street, if that is less than 4% but greater than the ADA uh, required 2%, we would allow that to essentially be deferred and so we would not require um, an improvement if that's the only ADA deficiency. Uh, permit fees, the municipal code has three tiers of revocable permit fees. We're proposing that these would be under tier two as uh, for the regular, anything complying with this policy. Tier two under the municipal code is anything that requires a field visit by our staff, whereas tier one does not require a field visit. Because we, our staff will need to determine if the sidewalk there is ADA compliant for the ADA compliance portion of this policy, that would require a tier two revocable permit. So that's the proposal of this policy. And those are existing fees. We're not creating any new fees at Correct. this time, right? Yes. Okay, go ahead. Correct. Um, eligible applicants, we're proposing that the eligible applicants for these encroachments be limited to the legal owners of the adjacent property. 
due to the various uh, requirements that we have with res regard to insurance and liability and maintenance. Um, you know, the property owners, we have a way to record that responsibility to the deed of the property, which is um, how we've typically handled those in the past. And that also relates to accountability and responsibility as well. Correct. Okay. Um, technical review, so we're, it, it, it's impossible, or not, maybe not impossible, it's a very, very tall order to think of every situation of what people might apply for. And so we've generically just said, proposed here that the Bureau of Engineering will do a technical review for these. We'll uh, do a technical review to ensure that the proposed materials are safe and appropriate for use in the public right of way and the locations of them and whatnot. Um, similar with aesthetic requirements, um, we're proposing that we will um, kind of at staff level do an aesthetic review and if we have concerns that would trigger it to need to come to the Board of Public Works for approval if it doesn't appear consistent with the, the surrounding area and whatnot. Uh, public safety installations, from time to time we get requests for installations such as bollards for security concerns. The policy is proposing that any such public safety installations, um, depending on the reason whether it be safety security or fire type uh, concern that we will consult with the police department and or the fire department as appropriate for those to get their um, confirmation that they agree with it. Um, and lastly, deviations from policy requirements. So um, there will be, you know, some installations that people want to, applicants want to propose that do not comply with the policy. So we're proposing that anything that does not comply with the policy as written would require a tier three revocable permit, which is an actual cost permit and would require Board of Public Works approval. One second. Uh, sure. One second, uh, Ted, Commissioner Cabello. Uh, thank you, President James. I'm just curious, and I'm sorry to interrupt you, Mr. Allen. No if problem. a neighborhood group or association that is not the adjacent property owner wants to place a planter or a ballard or some kind of beautification object in the public right of way and they're not able to do it under this R permit, what are their options? So I would, I can think of two options. One is if they qualify for the Adopt-A-Median program, they could apply under the Adopt-A-Median program. Um, if they don't qualify or they prefer, they could apply for it under a tier three revocable permit and come before the board and request approval uh, by the Board of Public Works for an exemption to the policy, essentially. Thank you. Mm -hmm. The rest of the proposed policy really just outlines our standard revocable permit um, items, every, things that apply to every revocable permit that we issue. Would you, go, would you go through it, though? Sure, just because, okay. Um, I, I know we have a written, and it's available online, but for folks that may be listening or listen in later, um, i like the oral record to reflect it. Sure, be happy to. Um, so we have an online application process so they can start the process by applying online. Um, the Bureau of Engineering, once uh, the applicant has applied, the Bureau of Engineering prepares what's called a revocable permit requirements letter. Um, and we will give them, the applicant, the requirements after you know our review of what's required for that uh, particular permit. Um, appeals, uh, as if they want to appeal any finding, the applicant can appeal to the Board of Public Works, um, which would trigger it to become a tier three revocable permit. If there's a change of ownership on a permit that has already been issued, um, we would generally handle that as a tier one revocable because we don't need to revisit the field at that point typically, so we clarify that. Um, but they will need to uh, refile some of the things that I'll go through here shortly, such as waiver of damages and proof of liability. Um, Noncompliance, if uh, the applicant does not comply with permit conditions, uh, Bureau of Street Services Investigation Enforcement Division will be notified to investigate any complaints. Citations may be issued for noncompliance. Uh, proof of liability insurance shall be renewed annually with the risk management group and the CAO, so the applicant is required to maintain liability insurance. Uh, a covenant shall be recorded to memorialize maintenance responsibilities. Uh, it's recorded on the deed of the property with the county clerk, or county recorder, sorry. Um, waiver of damages shall be signed and notarized by underlying property title holder and shall be recorded with the county recorder's office. 
Um, the revocable permit is a permit that gives the permission for the encroachment, but in cases where that encroachment requires some construction work, then they need to get the appropriate construction permit, which is generally an A permit, sometimes a B or E permit, but usually A permits for these types of work. Um, and the revo revocation process, um, just a reminder that revocable permits may be revoked by the Board of Public Works or the Bureau of Engineering. Uh, the standard policy is if the permit was issued by the Bureau of Engineering, it can be revoked by the Bureau of Engineering, but if it was issued by the Board of Public Works, then we would come back before the Board before revoking that permit. That's been the, the general practice. Um, and that concludes my report. Thank you, Mr. Allen. Sure. Commissioner Cabello. Thank you, President James. Um, can you just, for the public record and for clarity, explain the various tiers and what, and what they are, and just for anybody listening in? Sure. Uh, there's three tiers of revocable permit outlined in the municipal code. I, I believe we outlined them in the board report as well. So for the record, the tier one uh, revocable permit, the current fee amount is $556, and that applies to revocable permits where a field visit is not required by city staff in order to issue the permit. A tier two permit is um, a permit uh, that does require a field investigation by city staff, but does not require a Board of Public Works uh, approval. And then lastly, and that's $1,854 for the permit fee. A tier three permit is an actual cost permit, so we track actual city costs. We take a deposit and um, the applicant reimburses actual city costs. Those are cases where we, uh, items need to come before the board, uh, whether like in a case, if, where there's a policy and it's not complying with the policy, such as this one that we're hearing today, or sidewalk dining, or the Bureau of Engineering has made a certain determination of a requirement on that permit and the applicant doesn't agree and would like to appeal that item to the board. Those are types of things that trigger it to become a Tier 3 permit. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Allen. Um, uh, so a couple of things. Um, I, and Adele Hodge Khalil from Street Services, Streets LA is here um, on to address enforcement issues. One second, Adele, on that. Um, and we may have some uh, I, we may have some questions. I've got some questions along those lines. Um, I, I do want to thank all of the entities that uh, were involved um, in helping um, uh, draft this uh, policy as a result of the board's motion back in February. Um, one question on um, the uh, the public safety element, uh, public safety installations, and my recollection, you've got, what is it, 42 inches, which is basically three and a half feet? Correct. So for, I'm going to use an, an example that exists. Um, for a, uh, a stainless steel, in effect, stainless steel rail, mm -hmm. it, they call it fencing, but it's really more of a railing. Um, that is um, a couple of feet away from the building. Um, that's something that uh, would fall under the review of police and or fire, likely fire department, um, in consultation with the Bureau of Engineering as to whether or not to permit that encroachment on the public right-of-way being the purpose to keep um, a two-foot, in essence, uh, safe space uh, to prevent what has happened in the past fires from reaching the building. Understood? Correct. This policy would allow for that type of railing. It would, we would confer with the fire department. We would do our typical technical review. But provided it meets the other requirements of the guidelines, such as uh, providing the five-foot pedestrian access route and whatnot, uh, it would be allowed under this policy. Okay. Um, in any event, um, could the applicant, um, the under this policy, the applicant could, either the applicant or an opponent could appeal whatever the initial determination is to the Board of Public Works, correct? Correct. Okay. I just want to make sure that if we end up with a, um, a dispute of sorts that the board has, there's an opportunity for a public hearing and the, the board can have a public hearing and hear from the fire department 
um, as well as adjacent property owners and other stakeholders to make a, a final decision on the permit. Yeah, that's a good point. One of our typical practices, which wasn't actually written here, um, if an item is controversial, we get opposition from the neighborhood to an item or something like that. That is another um, mechanism that can trigger it to go to a tier three and requiring Board of Public Works approval. Okay. Uh, Commissioner Garcia. Thank you, President James. <clears throat> I just have a question for clarification. You said this does not include sidewalk dining. Can you explain to me just very briefly the two differences and how would somebody, for example, if I owned a restaurant, where do I, where do I approach first would be one of the big questions. Yeah, so if an item is sidewalk dining related, with the board has adopted a sidewalk dining policy, so a sidewalk dining application would still be allowed, but it, we would follow the sidewalk dining policy and guidance for what can be allowed for that application. And so this, I just wanted to see the difference of, of both the sidewalk dining and this. So if somebody has already sidewalk dining, can they potentially apply for this R permit as well? Yeah, if they wanted an additional encroachment that's not related to sidewalk dining, yes. Um, if, if you're a new applicant and you wanted a little of both, we would do it under one revocable permit, but we would follow the sidewalk dining policy as far as what's allowed for the sidewalk dining portion of the application. And then let's say they wanted um, something on a different part of the a property away from that. Yeah. We would make sure that complied with this portion of the policy. But they are fairly uh, consistent with one another. They both require, you know, the pedestrian access route and whatnot. So, and making the, the ADA compliance within the area of the improvements with the exception for the 4% cross slope. So there, mm -hmm. this policy is drafted to be very consistent with that policy. Okay, thank you, Ted. Um, and just uh, to answer a, a question that, that may come up regarding the, um, and I touched on it a minute ago during your presentation, Mr. Allen, about the requirements for the adjacent property owner uh, being the, um, uh, the applicant. Uh, some communities might want to apply by block um, for one permit. The problem with that, while it sounds well, that, like that's the most efficient way to go, the problem with that is it's not necessarily the most efficient way to go for either the city or the applicant under the following scenario. Sometimes a block can have a, new, a number of different businesses. A business may move, a business may expand, a business may go out of business. Um, and it, that would interrupt then the insurance requirements, the liability insurance requirements, the whole permit. So that's why you have it attached to the adjacent property owner because then the rest of them can still be in place um, and you would only have to, in essence, repair or revise or update for the property owner that has left or vacated for some other purpose, correct? That's correct, yeah. It would get very, very difficult to manage multiple waivers of damages and proof of insurance and, um, you know, all of those different requirements for multiple properties under one permit. And then, as you mentioned, anytime any one of those needed to change, we would have to reopen and reissue the permit for all of those properties at once. So. Um, yeah, the recommendation of the working group for that reason was that each adjacent, adjacent property owner would apply for their own permits if multiple property owners wanted to have encroachments along a block. Okay. Um, Commissioner Davis. I wanted to ask a question re <clears throat> with regard to enforcement. My understanding is... Oh. So, okay, so let's do this. Um, let's have... Um, uh, Mr. Haj Khalil from the Bureau of Street Services come up. Um, Adele, you can uh, talk about uh, the, uh, our motion and what um, it, uh, back in February, what that meant sure. for the existing, as it's framed there, illegal uh, planters um, and what we do going forward uh, after, after the, um, uh, I don't necessarily want to use the term grace period, but it was in essence a grace period and, and now we're moving beyond that. Good morning, Adele Hoshkali with Streets LA. Uh, I have with me uh, Chief Gary Harris, who oversees the investigation and uh, and compliance uh, with uh, Streets LA. Uh, you know, the motion that was adopted by your board back in February of this year, uh, directing the development of this policy, 
basically said that for the installations that happened prior to the adoption of the motion, that they will be stay on these locations as long as they are uh, ADA compliant and they're not a safety hazard. Uh, currently, out of the survey that we have uh, of what's out on the streets in LA, we have about 300 locations of uh, unpermitted installations uh, that uh, have are out out there as uh, that basically require some permit uh, once this policy is adopted. So we have about 299, uh, and that have been uh, surveyed by our team. Uh, the the good thing about this policy is it takes away this undercover, you know, uh, at night going uh, behind the scenes to install things that may not be safe, may be illegal, and and we don't want people to do this, uh, you know, under the, uh, you know, w you know, without, uh, you know, uh, knowledge any, any people going out putting it without, uh, you know. Uh, anybody seeing them, what they're doing. We've had recently some installations that were basically substandard. They were, uh, you know, a foot high, metal, sharp metal, with bottomless uh, containers that can be a hazard for people, tripping hazard at night, uh, sharp. Uh, and, and we don't want to deal, deal with those things. And, and it's, it brings a lot of burden on our staff uh, enforcing it. Uh, to me, I think by having this policy, It also subjects us not only the public to danger, but it also susceptibles the city and the taxpayer to liability because we're going to get sued on those, not the adjacent property owners. And, and exactly right, uh, Mr. James. Or, or, and, uh, or we'll be sued with the adjacent property owners, but yeah. Sure, I mean, the city will be liable. And our, our goal is to provide a city that's safe uh, for everyone. And uh, this is really what we're here for. But also the cost of our staff having to go out and, and take care of the unsafe uh, conditions that takes time and resources away from the work that we should be doing, preserving and taking care of the streets in Los Angeles. I think with this policy, I think it puts it a clear path for people to, uh, for the community, the business owners, uh, the property owners to apply for something if that's something that they need to put in front of their property. Uh, I think they can get the permit they need uh, and, and, and then they're required to maintain it. It's, uh, that's the condition that the, the, uh, the policy has, is when you place something on the streets, on the sidewalk, you're responsible for maintaining it. It doesn't just, you can't put it in and now somebody else's responsibility. That's the covenant agreement that has to be put in place. And that's why the relationship between what is installed and with the property owner, we know who to go to. The biggest frustration for our staff is when they go to, to a installation, they don't know who installed it, who's the responsible party. We don't know anybody. There is no uh, person to talk to. And, uh, and so it's, it's been very difficult for us. And I believe with this policy, it really puts this back on the right track. Uh, and, uh, and we are looking forward to working with the community. I think we've had meetings with some of the community members in Venice and really they look forward to working with us on, uh, you know, permitting the existing ones, but also uh, uh, applying for any new ones they want to do without really having to do it, you know, under the, uh, you know, darkness of night and, and have to do it that, you know, when nobody's looking. Uh, so to me, once the policy is adopted by the board, we have about 299 locations across the city. Uh, we will, with your board's concurrence, we're thinking about allowing them at least three months to apply, uh, maybe somewhere around the end of the year, December 31st, that they will have to apply by that time. Otherwise, they become illegal and they can be subject to removal. Uh, but for now, I think what we would like to do is, uh, is have this policy adopted and then uh, we'll work with the Bureau of Engineering, which I applaud uh, their efforts and, and everybody's efforts in making this policy something that we can work with. And I believe this is something that can really help our staff and our inspectors really enforce uh, the law and ensure that we have uh, uh, furniture that whatever is on the street is safe accessible uh, and works. And I've done some visits and uh, I've seen some of these installations and some are, are good, they work, but some can, you know, uh, be dangerous if they're too close to the landing from a bus where if a passenger is coming off the bus, they have to have a space on the sidewalk 
to get off. Otherwise, they cannot get off or a disabled uh, member of the community can't get off. So, so this spacing is critical. What's being put is critical. How high is critical for us to ensure that, that we have something that we can enforce and is safe. The bottom line is safety. And now with this policy, we know who to talk to if there's something that needs to be taken care of. It's not the re residents of the city that have to burden the cost. It, can, it has to be the owner of that improvement through this permit process. So I look forward to working uh, with your board, uh, with our staff and with Bureau of Engineering on, on processing these 299 locations, but also working with the community and business members across the city to process uh, any new permits. All right, thank you, Adele. We'll start with um, Commissioner Davis for on enforcement. <laughs> yeah, I think uh, <clears throat> the director has answered most of my inquiry with regard to our capacity to be able to manage this. You said that we have approximately 299 to date that we have knowledge of and that we have intentions of extending a 90-day period to individuals to get up to speed in terms of being able to apply for this permit. And my final question to you would be, um, given the data of what we have out there as it relates to this policy, what impact will it have on our capacity to be able to manage this as it relates to staffing and the things that you have to do given that you have other things that that team has to also do? Does it present a burden of any type or obviously uh, you have given some thought to this before the policy? To me, uh, I mean, I will have Gary answer, but uh, at this point, uh, there is a cost recovery through the permit fee right now. That's a good thing about applying for the permit. Right. There is a cost recovery of some cost. Would, we're, we are actually responding to these things now without any cost recovery. So, so I think this will make it easier on us because now we have an owner, we have a responsible party we can go to. Uh, we have staff that are th out there anyway, but I think it's once you put it and make a process for this, I think will make it easier okay. than us just going randomly and going out there just enforcing. Uh, so we will evaluate the resources, but at least we'll have a some revenue coming in through the permit process. But we will continue working through and reviewing the resources. But I feel actually this will be much better for us than having a no permit and having things that are being put illegally and we have to respond to them. Good to hear that. Gary, Thank you. Things. Yes, Mr. Harris, Chief Harris, welcome. Thank you. And additionally, the 90-day period will help us to manage staff more effectively in dealing with the locations we know. Also, it gives us a marker beyond these 300 we know of. Anything we find now is considered a new installation. So we won't have to have such a long waiting period for those to do enforcement. Additionally, by giving this reasonable period of time, when we do move to the A citations or other adjudicating bodies that hear the case for illegal installation, uh, it gives us a stronger chance of getting fee recovery because it shows that we've taken every possible means to allow the alleged violator to come into compliance. And it just makes it stronger for us when we do uh, our compliance uh, to get a favorable ruling from the adjudicator. So resource-wise, the, the main issue for us is having sufficient time to go out and deal with the locations, and the 90 days will give us that time. So um, uh, thank you, Ms. Uh, Chief Harris and Commissioner Davis. I've got a couple of things. Um, one, I, uh, Adele, I like the, rather than the 90 days, if we give everyone till December 31st, that's the end of the year. It's a date that everybody can remember, um, and it's it's about what 15 days longer. So it's you know it's the, it's basically three and a half months. We can almost start exactly. We can start next year fresh. Yes. Yeah. Um, and uh, so everyone would need to get in their um, uh, applications by December 31st. So the decision doesn't have to be made by the bureaus on the permits by December 31. I recognize that we're going to have likely a, a couple hundred permits permit applications come in, but the applications need to be in by December 31st. Close of business December 31st, okay. yes. Um, I've got another question. This is uh, somewhat case specific and it may involve Mr. Jordan as well. But there's, um, and it falls in this area of um, per, of, of uh, uh, 
structures, it, and uh, it, it's, it's, it's a railing uh, that was put in a couple of feet from the building to prevent fire from touching the building, and it has pretty much by all accounts been successful. Um, they are, the entities are unpermitted. They would like to be permitted, and under this policy, there's a, poli there's a possibility of permission. Those folks need to apply um, for a permit just like anybody else within this period from today to December 31st, correct? That's correct. Okay. What if one or two or more of those businesses received an A citation um, in that same window of time? And Ted, this, might, this is something, Mr. Jordan, for for you perhaps, you may not even be able to answer the question, I just, I put it on the table because what if we have someone out there that has an ACE citation intact, but clearly they're in this arena of a possible permit and, you know, they, they may indeed get a, get a permit. My first question, and, and just thinking out loud, the answer might be that you still have to clear your ACE permit, your ACE citation but you still may be eligible for a permit, but maybe because you're permitted, an A citation would turn into like a fix-it ticket. In the cases where we're aware that someone is eligible for a permit and we've recently issued an A citation, then we would request to the city attorney to withdraw that particular citation. At this point, now that we know that this is moving forward, obviously, we would change our enforcement pattern to fit whatever's approved here today. Uh, we would go out and issue ACEs on things that we know are eligible for, mit, for permits. But unfortunately, those who received ACEs six months ago, those have already been adjudicated. and We have no means of, of uh, taking that citation back. However, they are still eligible now, though, to apply for a permit and move forward under the new process. Okay. Anything different than that, Ted? Um, no, I, I, I think for those I older say ones. Supplemental to what Chief Harris said. I think for those older ones, I don't know if there's any okay. way to deal with those older ACE. Uh, obviously, people can apply for permits and move forward and then legalize the encroachments. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Commissioner Cabello. Thank you, President James. I have a question for Mr. Allen. Thank you, Mr. Hodge Khalil and Chief Harris. So we discussed this policy before, um, Mr. Allen, and one thing that I did bring up that I said I was going to bring up today was outreach. I'm just very, uh, I'm not very concerned, but I always want to make sure that both the department and the bureaus always go above and beyond to make sure that folks know about new policies when they're enacted, what the rules are. So I'm just going to request, I don't think I need to do a formal motion, Dr. Campos, but I would just request that the bureau when all the information I'm assuming is up and running on the website, because the board has yet to adopt the policy, which I support, um, and I think it's a good policy, um, not only send the new link and any other relevant information, I know that you were going to do some kind of, not one pager, I know, but some kind of information sheet, to neighborhood councils, um, but not only them, but to all the council offices, and specifically, not just the chiefs of staff, but to the district directors as well. So both the chiefs of staff and the district directors of the council offices. Just want to ensure that you would uh, go ahead and do that. Yeah, we can do that. So we have an online development services permit manual. It will have a section with the guidelines for this policy if it's adopted and, and supplemental information about the types of things we look for in our technical review and whatnot. And that's available to the public. Um, so we can, and once that's drafted, send those links to the offices you mentioned, um, including the district directors, so that they're aware of uh, this resource outlining the requirements. I appreciate it. And where can this handbook or guideline be found? Can you give the website currently? I know it doesn't include the current policy but that we're discussing. I'll have to get back to you on that. I'll okay. look it up. I don't have it memorized. But I, we're about to do a press release on the new version of this uh, uh, permit manual so that um, pending board approval of course yeah well the <laughs> the permit manual itself will be there this section would be added pending you know depending on board approval okay. yes <laughs> thank you very much sure my pleasure uh, thank you um, Commissioner Garcia thank you President James um, 
Can Ted, Ted, this, I imagine this is for you. Can you um, go over the appeal process again? Because I'm reading number three, and it's what I'm understanding is that the appeal can only be made by the applicant, the permit applicant. Is that right? And and my, I guess the second follow-up question was, what if the neighbor doesn't agree with the current and or and or the neighborhood council? How, what so is the process of appeal? There's two different. Um, there's one type of appeal, which is by the applicant when they don't agree with the Bureau okay, of Engineering requirements. Mm -hmm. That would come before the board. We'd write a board report. We would outline um, you know, their request and our position on it and bring it before the board for a board decision. Um, so that's technically what we refer to as an appeal. Right. There's another situation where if there's community opposition of some type to a, a certain permit, then our typical practice is then, because it's controversial, we will write a board report. In that case, we will be outlining the applicant's application and we will be supporting that application, you know, if that was our finding. But then we would also, um, you know, outline the opposition or uh, comments that were received and bring it before the board so that um, both parties could be heard and the board would make that decision. Okay, thank you. And just so you know, Commissioner Garcia, we've done that. It happens um, on occasion. Um, sometimes they're high profile, sometimes they're not. We had a water slide they wanted to put out here um, some years ago. You, yeah, you may, you, and, and we, end up, we end up hearing it at the Board of Public Works. Uh, you know, there's, that's part of the purpose of the board is to provide that, that appellate authority, um, uh, a place for folks to go to appeal. Um, I don't think I have um, another question right now, uh, Mr. Allen. I've got a couple of speaker cards, so let me call the speaker cards. Um, Mr. Nelson, Miguel Nelson, and anyone else that wants to speak, if you want to put in a speaker card, we're happy to hear from you on item number one. Go Hi. ahead, sir. Um, I, don't, I don't actually have a question. I, I wasn't sure what was going to be said, and I'm in full support of everything you're doing, and I really appreciate your efforts. I know you've got a lot of complicated issues, but uh, good work. Okay. Thanks. Thank you, sir. Uh, Mr. Sachs? Is that Ms. Lopez? Is that a speaker card from you as well? Okay. Mr. Sachs. Yes, thank you. Uh, I don't. I don't find this very interesting at all. Um, best laid plans of mice and men. Is it laid plans or made plans? Uh, There's a few things. Somebody mentioned a change of ownership. Um, what happens if in a change of ownership? Somebody mentioned the applicant's liability. What happens if there's a change of ownership? Is the applicant still liable? Somebody mentioned construction for required for sidewalk encroachment, and then they get a permit. Shouldn't they get a permit for the sidewalk construction and then come before you to get encroachment? Um, anybody ever heard of the Billionaire Boys Club movie? It was a movie that was made, and, and uh, the billionaire boys were somewhat running a it's a Ponzi scheme, and yet they depended on somebody who had a letter of credit from a New York writer doing a biography on somebody who was running his own Ponzi scheme, and everything collapsed, and the New York, the guy writing the, uh, running the Ponzi scheme from New York was killed. What needs to happen here is there needs to be a limit on some of these permits that are issued. The related company with the construction, they had a CUP for 10 years. 10 years they hold on to property. There's property that's issued CUPs for 10, 12, 15 years. People change jobs. People change positions in their offices. Nobody knows who's who. So what you need to do, if you really want to do this right, is limit the amount of time that these permits are issued for. If they don't get the work done, if they can't find... There's, there's uh, investors all over. You just heard a story about a company that's worth $47 billion. They're looking for investors. There's investors all over for the city of Los Angeles. Let them have the investment in line and then come before you and get a, a CUP or whatever permit is needed, and then they can go to work. Don't give them the opportunity to screw the public. Uh, thank you, Mr. Sachs. Um, Estelle Lopez.
Good morning, Commissioners. Estela Lopez, Executive Director of the Industrial District BID. I want to thank you very much, and that thank you also extends to the departments who worked on this to bring um, reason and a system by which property owners and business owners can bring their case and put this application through to the city. There's been a lot of confusion and um, misinformation, and, and you've done a great job, and I just want to thank you for that. Um, one additional comment to Commissioner Cabello. In terms of outreach, could you please add business improvement districts? Absolutely. I think that, that would be a, a very helpful tool. And I don't know if Mr. Allen, who I heard found the link and will give it after public comment, um, if uh, he needs some assistance with getting the, the email addresses to bids, but I'm sure our friends at the mayor's office would be more than happy to assist him getting all the email addresses. But yes, I want as thorough out, uh, an outreach as possible. So thank you, Ms. Lopez. Perfect. Thank you all for your help. Thank you, including the Chamber of Commerce and, and other other entities that we um, that we work with on these issues. Um, Larry Rauch. Uh, good morning, Commissioners. My name is Larry Rauch. I'm with Los Angeles Cold Storage. I want to support what you're doing. It's good to have clarity. It's good to have uh, a path where this can be done. And I thank you for the hard work that all the uh, different departments put into it. And it looks like a good plan. So thank you. Thank you, sir. Um, so, yes, Mr. Allen. I apologize. I was afraid to do it from memory in case I was wrong, but it uh, is verified. So it's engpermitmanual.lacity.org. There's no spaces or underlines or anything like that. Just engpermitmanual.lacity.org. And so all of our various permit requirements that they're including revocables and we'll add a section for this and then send that link. So just uh, just to repeat that, ENG permit manual one word dot lacity.org and maybe our esteemed public affairs officer can send that out at some point in one of our future newsletters as well to remind folks. Yes. <laughs> thank you. Uh, thank you. So uh, it, I just have well, uh, one last question. Um, either uh, Mr. Hodgecleal, Chief Harris, or um, Mr. Jordan. Uh, regarding any, um, uh, ig any outstanding uh, ACE citations, just so we're clear, Mr. Harris, you and I had a dialogue about that a minute ago. If someone is in possession, uh, we, we already determined between yourself and Mr. Jordan that Older A citations, for example, over six months old, um, likely have to be adjudicated. But for any that were recently, that may have been, I don't, and I don't know if there are, are any A citations that have recently been issued, some of those may be this subject to a request of retraction if the, uh, if the apparatus falls in today's policy. That's correct. As long as it has not been adjudicated or processed through the citation processing unit, then we can retract those citations. Okay. Um, the um, Do you know if your office has issued any such a citations that might be subject to this? I realize I'm calling on you to speculate uh, just kind of off the top of your head. But to my knowledge, we have not at this point, no. Okay. The, the, the only citations that, to your recollection, were issued were issued before the um, the Board of Public Works motion that placed basically a grace period back in February. That's correct. Okay. All right. Thank you for, for clearing that up. Um, Commissioner James, I think yes. the key thing that we need to reflect that as with your board policy today, our enforcement compliance will, will be adjusted to ensure that that discussion happens with uh, when we encounter a improvement that we let them know about the permit process that's going to be part of an education so we're not going to go to the ace we will go to the uh, to let them know about the process to apply for a revocable permit uh, we're going to work with uh, the existing locations because we know 299 that we know of but we may see we may be able to maybe discover some additional ones that we haven't uh, been aware of uh, but i think our efforts will be to uh, communicate the board's new policy and the need for them to apply uh, as long. I want to keep stress the, th the key thing. If the existing 
planter or uh, construction furniture, whatever we have on the sidewalk is unsafe or an ADA uh, causes an ADA violation, those will be subject to removal still. So we're not gonna allow those to have a grace period. However, we worked with the community that uh, before we remove them, we will give them notice to allow the owner to remove these on their own and, and, and put them in their private property while they apply for a permit and put them the right way. So I wanna make sure that everybody knows that we cannot allow for unsafe conditions or conditions that cause uh, ADA. So the grace period that we give till the end of uh, December is only for the ones that do not have an ADA violation or they're not an issue uh, that is creating a safety hazard. Okay, um, and I, I also, I don't want to, by today's action, discourage, and I don't think we are, discourage uh, businesses that, that have put up, I'm back on the, the, the railings again, businesses that have gotten a, an A citation in the past but still may be eligible for a permit, they should still apply for the permit because mm -hmm. they may still be permitted. There's still uh, a public safety element that our fire department um, and the community might like to see. Yeah, we fully agree. I mean, with your policy today, it allows them to apply for that, and we encourage them to apply because yeah, that's and, it. And then their lawyers can decide how to deal with that with later the previous, through, the, with the through an appeal ACE. on the ACE process, and that's, sure. that's up to them. But, okay. That, all right. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Cavell. I really do hope this will be my last question. Thank you, President James. And I think I believe it's for Mr. Allen more than, more than uh, Streets LA. So apologies for making you play pop up and pop down. Okay. Um, so, uh, just to Mr. Haj Khalil's point about unsafe conditions or ADA standards, can you go over just certain types of materials that are acceptable and not acceptable and conditions that are acceptable and not acceptable as groups or property owners rather may think through what they want to put or have put maybe unpermitted in the public right of way? Yeah, so in general, our staff will be, in doing the technical review, they'll be looking for materials that are durable. Um, so typically we don't allow wood or things like that that are not durable for the public right of way. They'll be looking to make sure they don't drain water into the walk path. That's one of the things they'll look at. They, they'll look at the height to make sure it's within an acceptable, for instance, we wouldn't permit something that's like four inches tall because it's a tripping hazard. So off the top of my head, I don't remember our minimum height, but there's a minimum height that we'll look at. There's a maximum height, as we mentioned, four to two inches. Um, no sharp edges, you know, which is another reason wood is not typically allowed because splinters and things like that. So uh, staff will be looking to make sure that the material is safe and durable, essentially. Thank you. And one other thing that I'll, it's in the report, but I'll just mention it. Line of sight um, is also important. We don't want to block line of sight for pedestrians um, or uh, uh, motorists or, um, or anyone that's, maybe using a scooter or um, some other um, uh, way of getting around. Right, that's an excellent point. And another one, uh, you know, with plants, if it's something that involves plants, if it's not on the uh, Streets LA standard plantings list, then we will consult with them, but typically they would never allow something that's spiny or prickly or maybe a safety hazard for the public as well. Okay, well, thank you for the clarification. Um, this is a complicated issue. I appreciate the work of everyone, uh, the, 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 the um, uh, stakeholders that uh, show, took the time to show up today. We appreciate that as well. Um, thank you for the collaboration in the building with uh, all the folks that worked on this. Uh, it's a complicated issue. It will continue to be a complicated issue for the foreseeable future, I think. Um, but we have uh, more clear guidelines in place, and we have uh, an appellate process where we can have a public hearing uh, and have a fair hearing for everyone to be heard as we make future decisions on some of the more complicated or even potentially controversial ones. Uh, we have um, uh, an avenue for, for everyone to be heard. So with that, I'll make a motion that we adopt agenda item number one, uh, seconded uh, by Commissioner Cabello. Uh, any objection? Without objection, we'll adopt agenda item number one. Any issue sending uh, number one forthwith? We'll send number one forthwith. Uh, thank you, everyone. Uh, Dr. Campos, have we cleared the desk? This takes you to the approval of the minutes. Thank you, thank you. So, 
Uh, Commissioner Cabello has seconded my motion that we approve minutes from two meetings, Friday, September 6th and Monday, September 9th, both 2019. Any objection? Without objection, we will approve those meeting minutes. Now have we cleared the desk? Yes, you have. Okay, then we are adjourned. Thank you, everyone.